You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. On today's Training Thursday show, I have a very special guest from the American Posture Institute, Dr. Krista Burns. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen. It's so great to join you and your audience. I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate you coming on as well. And this was actually pretty short notice. Literally, we just linked up yesterday. And so instead of me not doing you justice, what I would love you to do is just give maybe a minute or two intro about what you do, what you specialize in, and a little bit about your background, because I know that our listeners today are going to really benefit, and I have no doubt appreciate the information that you share with them. Great. Well, I'm Dr. Krista Burns, and I'm the co-founder of the American Posture Institute, and I'm a, a PhD in health ergonomics, as well as a certified posture expert, certified postural neurologist, and a doctor of chiropractic. So essentially what I love to do with the American Posture Institute is to take all this really important information that we have out there, all this research, and synthesize it into a way that we can put it out there to our audience in a way that you can take away bite-sized tips and tools for better posture and better postural correction. So at the American Posture Institute, we're teaching healthcare professionals worldwide how to have better postural correction systems for their clients. Amazing. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I think one of the reasons, too, we were able to connect is you are, at least now, I think in 2017, and we'll chat more about this, going to be able to take this more to the public, where before you were working with just, well, let's say, doctors of chiropractic, you were working with neurologists and other people to help their patients. But what I want to do is say, okay, how can we help the health professionals? But then also, how can we get this really important information out to your everyday person? And, you know, for the most part, I don't care who you are, very few of us escape the, you know, 20, 30 minute commute to work or sitting at a desk for at least four to five hours per day. It's almost unavoidable. And what happens is it's really not a one day thing, but accumulation over time of this poor posture. And I found it myself every once in a while, I literally catch myself with just like this rounded back and everything is round, almost like a Pac-Man, like a, a C. And so what I want to do is talk about, let's just, before we even get started, because we have some, we have a great top 10 list today for everyone. But what I want to do is, what are some of the symptoms like that you feel, well, here's the thing, your posture is associated with so many things, but we don't even know it. So what are the symptoms that someone with poor posture may have that actually is related to their posture, such as, let's talk about maybe headaches, things like that. I want, I want you to tell us. Yeah, that's such a great question. We all understand that our posture is the structural framework of our body, but what we common overlook is the symptoms that are associated with it. So if you have forward head posture, which is if you're looking down at your cell phone, for example, you have forward head posture, your shoulders roll forward, and then you get that C-shaped spinal curvature of your spine. So we see that patients present with headaches. They present with neck pain, decreased range of motion. You know, when you move your neck and you feel like you have pain down your shoulder, even down your arm. We see a lot of carpal tunnel. In addition to that, from a physiologic perspective, we see asthma because as you go forward, you're actually cutting off the diaphragm, which leads to shorter respiration cycles over time and, of course, leading to asthma. Also, I don't know if you guys have heard this before, but as of 2017, poor posture is actually considered a diagnostic factor of depression, meaning if you're seated at your desk and you have that C-shaped spinal curvature and forward head posture, as you're sitting there, maybe you're stressed out because you have deadlines of work or you know, you're thinking about the millions of things that you need to do, that amount of stress combined with poor posture, also combined with prolonged sitting, is an absolute trifecta leading to depression. And of course, the worst consequence that we've seen overall is early mortality. Research after research study has shown that prolonged sitting 
with postural hyperkyphosis, so that C-shaped spinal curvature and forward head posture is absolutely linked to early mortality. So I like to say that sitting's the new smoking, but standing alone is not the answer, meaning we want to stand and we want to be more active, but also we need these changes in posture. You don't have to stand 24 hours a day. You can be seated as well, but when you're seated, we want to encourage active sitting and having good posture while seated. Just by implementing this tip alone, and we'll go through 10 more, sure. but just by implementing this, we can help offset chronic chronic diseases associated with prolonged sitting and poor posture, and of course, offset early mortality. Without a doubt. I think that's really important that you brought that up because there's an old saying that your physiology affects your psychology. And so yeah. when you do have that kyphotic, those rounded shoulders, you're basically huddled up into this, almost like this... Um, cowarding type position and it's not a sign of strength and literally it sends those signals back to the brain as well and i really do like when they're when we're working with the psychology as well with the person is that they are pinning back those shoulders they are opening and expanding that rib cage and like you said you're also going to get more oxygen to your tissues so your yeah. energy is going to increase then the energy the oxygenation in your brain is going to be improved as well so i mean really great tips i'm sure you could go on and on i'm sure you've given seminars on this before yes but let's get right into our top 10 because I'm excited to really talk with people. We're going to call it our, our top 10 ways to improve posture, right? Like, what do we look for? How do we combat it from an everyday lifestyle perspective? And I'm looking at the list that we just chatted about. And I know for sure that these things are not only inexpensive, most of them cost nothing. What they are is becoming more aware. So let's get right into it. I'm, I'm excited. What's the first thing that you want to mention? I don't think these are an order of importance, but let's, let's chat about that. What's number one? Yeah, number one on the top 10 list is to be more active. Now, the reason I put that as number one is because a lot of time when people think about posture, they think about a static posture positioning, as in you stand there in a military position just standing straight or you're just sitting up straight for hours after hours. And I wanna be really clear that when we talk about good posture, we're talking about good dynamic posture and good postural stability with movements. So we encourage that you have good posture with dynamic movements. And one of the best ways to do that is to be more active within your workspace. So we recommend work fit or posture fit exercises. So these are going to include things like active sitting or living, you know, not having a sedentary lifestyle. So instead of just sitting at your desk, you know, in the plain old chair, you can actually activate, you know, you can go from sitting to standing, you can activate active sitting options. So number one is to be more active. Okay, great. Now, are you going to talk more about, you've mentioned a couple times now, what is active sitting? Is, is that number two? Yeah, we'll right, go right excellent. into that. Good, good. So yes. we want to have good ergonomic equipment that supports upright postural design. So number two is to get good ergonomic equipment and specifically active sitting options as well as stand capable desks. Now, if you're already thinking, oh, I don't want to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a new ergonomic chair or a new stand up desk, I totally understand. You can do very simple things to just raise your computer up to eye level if you're a desk worker. You can, you know, for example, if you want to stand up during the day, you can put books under your computer and that allows you to keep your computer at eye level while still standing in front and being able to work with good productivity. Now, also when you're seated, I highly recommend active sitting. Now, active sitting options include sitting on an exercise ball or sitting on a posture cushion. Mm -hmm. So an exercise ball, you can get at any, you know, any sports store for about $10. And what's so good about that is that it's an instable surface. Now, maybe you're sitting in a chair right now, and what you'll notice is that chair will hold you up against gravity regardless of your postural design. But when you have an instable surface, such as an exercise ball or a posture cushion, then it's unstable, meaning that if you have poor posture, you actually risk falling off. Now, that's a good thing because that stimulates our brain and stimulates our musculature to hold us upright. So instead of depending upon the chair to hold us upright against gravity, we're now dependent upon our body and upon our brain. So the active engagement of the musculature and our brain to hold our body upright against, you know, against gravity is such a good posture tip, and it'll keep you having nice, strong musculature and, of course, burning more calories throughout the day as well. So it's a win-win. <laughs> yeah, excellent. And I really like the, the physio ball idea. Uh, one is that just having that object in your office or at home. So one, it's a conversation piece. So that's always great. And yeah. you're getting more help. <laughs> but once you see that, it's kind of like, you know, it's not a big deal to take the stairs, you know, because it's just one more thing. But when you have a physio ball in your office, 
you're thinking more about your overall health. And so it's one more thing to add to the equation. And also it serves, I think, a purpose well beyond that. Because what happens is just like you were talking about, we teach our clients as well. There's a thing called a posterior a tilt or an anterior pelvic tilt. And so the best way to help people find their posture is to think of your hips as a bucket of water. And when you're on that physio ball, are they tip forward? Or are they tipped backwards or is that bucket level? Because I've seen people use a physio ball but still hunch forward and rest on their desk. So it still is yeah. just making <laughs> sure that you're not spilling that bucket with your hips backwards, causing that lordotic curve. Or, you know, when it's hyper, except I basically I'm sure you have a, a great technical term for it as well, but you end up a big curvature of the lower back as well, where you tighten up the erector spinae, that's your anterior pelvic tilt also tighten up your psoas muscles, which I know that you're going to speak with us about. But any feedback on that? Do you teach the same thing? Absolutely. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because here's one of the biggest misconceptions is that if you have ergonomic equipment in your office, then automatically you're better off. Right. But right. here's the deal. We like to focus on the person first. So actually optimizing the postural design of the person so they can withstand with good postural fitness and avoid postural collapse within the workplace. Now, a perfect example of postural collapse is maybe you're seated on an exercise ball, but you have a big curvature of your lower back, which is more common in women. So especially for our women that are listening, I want you guys to make sure that you don't have a big curvature of your lower back. Also, like you just mentioned, not slouched forward, you know, leaning on your desk while sitting on an exercise ball. Mm. By actually sitting up straight, you're going to have more activation to your brain, which is going to help you have more energy as well. And also, as you mentioned, if the hips go forward into what's called an anterior pelvic tilt, which just means that they're tipped forward, what that means is it's going to aggravate your hip flexor musculature. So if you've ever had that feeling where you went from sitting to standing and you felt a little bit of pain right in front of your hip, that was likely a tight hip flexor. So you can actually avoid that instead of needing to just do stretches all day long, we can actually get to the root cause and avoid that poor posture by having a good neutral pelvis while sitting on an exercise ball or while sitting on you know another active sitting, sitting solution. Excellent. So if people aren't willing to do the physio ball because maybe their work doesn't allow it or whatever might be there, just a little uh, yeah. apprehensive at first, would you recommend just taking their own chair and not using the backrest? Or is there another chair that you would recommend? I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Yeah, I highly recommend there with the ball. They also have structures where you can put the ball within it so that it doesn't roll away when you stand up. It doesn't cause a ruckus in the office. Sure. Also, there's small cushions, which we refer to as a posture cushion, that you can and you can find it on Amazon. And basically, you just put that right on your chair. And so it's very discreet. Nobody would, while you're seated, nobody would even know you're sitting on a posture cushion. So, and what's good about that is it simulates an exercise ball, but it, you can just set it right on your chair. So that's a really great solution, especially if, you know, maybe you're in a tight workspace or, you know, you're not sure if your boss will allow you to have an exercise ball in your office. So think about a posture cushion. And I think most offices will, but, you know, sometimes it's just um, being a little nervous yourself to be the first one to do that. But I'm telling you, it would catch on. And and they are so inexpensive that you could buy some for your coworkers as well, or even ask your office. I'm sure they, most places will do things like that now that that cost very little and that get you more engaged uh, with your health because it saves them money in the long run anyways with health insurance. So we can talk about this uh, because I love this topic about workplace ergonomics. But um, one thing I I did want to mention as well is that anything that Dr. Krista wants to recommend, I will put over at stephencabral.com forward slash 49 because I know that a lot of people are in the car listening to this as well on the commute. So don't worry about having to write everything down, listen in, get the information, and then we'll link everything up, whether it's to Amazon or or another website, whatever our preferred ones are, uh, that would be great. And I'll link up mine and we'll also link up Dr. Krista's recommendations. Does your next tip, is it more ergonomic based equipment? I'd love to hear maybe about stand up desks or, or things like that, that you might recommend as well. Great. Yeah. So the next tip is to utilize a posture reminder. And that is perfect for the conversation about a stand capable desk. Mm. So what I recommend with a posture reminder is we actually give our patients in our practice, we give them a little bracelet to wear that says posture by design. We also give them stickers to put up. Now you can just literally grab a sticker from the store and put it on your computer screen. And every time you see that sticker, it's your reminder to go into an upright postural design. And one of that reminders is to stand up 
up throughout the workday. Now, it's such a good solution if you have a stand capable desk, a desk that because let's face it, it's not one size fits all as much as we would like it to be with ergonomic equipment. It's just not, you know, we're different heights, we're different body shapes, we have different levels of fatigability. So we need to have this adaptability for ourselves within our workplace. So a stand capable desk that can actually go from standing to sitting and sitting to standing is an ideal solution. Now, as I mentioned, if you don't have the financial resources to purchase a you know a standing desk, then a great option is just putting books underneath your computer screen or underneath your, your keyboard, anything that you need to raise up to eye level when you don't do go from sitting to standing. So that's a very simple solution you can implement. And when you have that posture reminder, it's going to remind you to stand up and be more active throughout the day. So my best recommendation is not to just go from completely sedentary lifestyle to standing all day long, because I can tell you, you're going to have low back pain and you're gonna, your feet are going to start hurting right away if you do. But what I highly recommend is finding that perfect balance. And the best ratio for the majority of people is going to be three to one. So standing for three times the amount of time that you are sitting. So you can break up standing with rests of sitting. And then I do recommend when you're sitting to again, engage in active sitting solutions. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great. From the very beginning, when this was a couple years ago, when when, um, standing desks became really big, I said, we should not be having people at standing desks because we haven't taught them how to actually stand at their desk. So yes. people stand with locked out knees, and then that's yeah. going to be worse for your, your neurology. For And you're, you're basically allowing blood to pool in your legs, and the arches are collapsed in. So you're creating more of the fundamental breakdown by standing up with poor posture than you would be just simply seated because then at least you're not getting the same pooling. So, you know, yeah. all of this does matter. Like when all these gadgets and everything come out, we love them, and they actually are meant to help us but we still need to use the same principles, whether we're seated or standing, that the knees aren't locked out, that the shoulders are still back, and that we're still not leaning on our desk when standing, right? Of course, yeah, exactly. And that actually leads me right into the next tip, which is having good shoe support and having good standing posture. Mm -hmm. So you want to have the equipment that supports good standing posture. So when you make the shift to being more active in your workplace and you do stand up more often, then you need to have the tools that make you successful because if not, you're just going to be injuring yourself. So I want you wearing good shoes. You know, if you wear high heels, this is not going to be ideal. You know, I'm a woman myself. I think they look better as well. But let's face it, when it comes to our posture and when it comes to our body, we need to preserve our ability to thrive within our environment. And unfortunately, heels are not the best option because it shifts our weight forward. And then we are having all of our weight on the the forward part of our feet, which causes us to compensate with a larger curvature in our spine. So by having good shoe support, that's going to be a great recommendation. Also, if you can put a pad um, next to your desk where you're standing, so they, they're called anti-fatigue mats. And the reason I love those is because it provides you just a little bit of cushion that you need so you can stand comfortably. Because if you're standing on a hard floor, and again, you just went from being seated for hours upon hours, and then suddenly you want to make this change, if you don't have a mat or something comfortable to stand on, then it's going to hurt your feet at the beginning. So set yourself up for success because this is a very important lifestyle habit. So set yourself up for success with good shoes and having that anti-fatigue mat or even pulling a carpet. If you're standing on a hard floor, just pull a carpet right in front of your desk. That's a really good solution that you can utilize to support good standing posture. Excellent. Is there a a favorite anti-fatigue mat or gravity-based mat, as sometimes they're called, that you recommend? Yeah, I recommend Verydesk. And the reason I recommend those is they have just the plain mats, Mm -hmm. but they also have some more active mats. So one of the options is like a foot swing. So it's a mat, and then you can also put your foot on the swing. Now, why I love that is because you can shift your weight, which means that you have a change in posture throughout the day, and you can move your feet instead of just standing in a static posture. They also have these mats with um, a small ball underneath the foot, and that's really good if anybody's suffering from plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a really great stimulation for your foot that you can actively engage your feet throughout the day. And it's just a reminder to keep moving throughout the day as well. So those are some really good options to Excellent. consider as well. Yeah. One of my favorites literally is if I'm standing up doing work is to have one of those acuballs, which have all the little points on them. And it's just a yeah. foot massage. 
And so exactly. again, you're doing something, but you're massaging your feet, which, you know, if you're big on uh, reflexology or thinking about how the, the body works, I, I find that amazing. And it will actually just little things like that too, will be make you more apt to stand up because like, Oh, I'll give my foot a little massage by putting either a tennis ball or an acuball, something like that as well. So yeah, th- these yeah, things are all, I, I love these little tips and all these things are great. Good reminders for myself as well. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Anyway, I have one on here that I wanted to ask about next. It might not be in the yeah. order, but one big thing, and this goes, I, get, I think, obviously predominantly for men, but not necessarily. What about keeping a wallet or something in your back pocket? How is that affecting structurally your body? Like, why does that matter? Yeah, and that's such a great question. It's definitely on the list. Guys, stop sitting on your wallet. Maybe you're actually sitting on your wallet right now as we're listening to this podcast. And it is more common in men. Now, what happens is if your wallet is in your back pocket and you're seated. Now, if you were to look at your pelvis, which is your hips, then you might see that one side is higher than the other. By sitting on your wallet, especially if there's a lot of money in there, which is a good problem to have, I understand. But especially if there's a lot of money in there, it's going to be a thicker wallet and it's going to create more of a pelvic unleveling. Now, if you're seated for five minutes on your wallet, you're not going to feel the the effects necessarily. But over time, for 20 years, if you're seated on this wallet every time you sit down, it can create very serious postural distortion patterns, which often result in sciatica. So if you've ever had that feeling where you have that shooting pain down your leg, this could be the culprit. And it's so simple to change. And it's so simple to prevent by simply not sitting on your wallet and creating that pelvic unleveling situation while seated. Excellent. Yeah, without a doubt. And you can just see if one hip is raised a little higher than the other, that you're going to get that tightness on the QL or the tightness in the iliacus or any of those hip-based muscles just because literally it's in a shortened position. So sometimes when you tell people like, you know, just straightforward, your hip is lifted. And when it's lifted, it's going to get tighter on that side. And that's going to then cause compensation on the other side. So and, and like you said, it's never a one-time thing. You know, usually uh, it builds up <laughs> over time. Just to, to continue what you're saying here is that we're one large kinetic chain. So anything that you do to one part of the body affects the rest of the body. We're one whole organism. So if you're seated on your wallet, which seems like such a small thing, and I totally understand you're going, whoa, does that really matter that much? But just by changing that much, it creates a compensation, for example, your opposite shoulder, which then creates a compensation with your cervical spine. So just by changing the position of your hips, it creates a change in compensation postural distortion patterns in the rest of the body. So by keeping the pelvis, which is the base of your spine, nice and level, then you can actually prevent all of this degeneration from occurring over time due to postural distortion patterns. Excellent. Yeah, completely agree. And that's why I think this next tip, which I want to talk about moving your body in multiple planes of motion is so important because we have to understand that literally we're built from the ground up. And so if we're not like we have to look at the feet, we need to look at how the body's moving. And if that isn't right, meaning we need to, which we'll talk about at the end, the, the exams of how to examine your body, which I think is really important to look at. But um, let's talk about that. How does moving your body in these multiple planes help us? Yeah. You know, what's so interesting about our occupations is that sometimes we become a slave to our occupation in terms of the physiology of our body, meaning that we only move in the ways that are designed through our occupation. And what we tend to see is repetitive movements in one plane of motion. So think about hammering a nail, for example, or painting a wall. These are examples of moving your body in one plane of motion. Now, again, if you move a couple of times in one plane of motion, you won't feel a lot of pain. However, over time, if you keep doing this throughout the, the course of your career and you don't have these multiplanar motions, then it can create repetitive stress injuries. So repetitive stress injuries are going to be things like carpal tunnel syndrome. You know, if you've ever had pain or you know throbbing or tingling in your hand, that could be a carpal tunnel, for example. It can create epicondylitis, these things such as pain in your elbow. Mm -hmm. So you can prevent that by doing multi-planar movements. Now, also from a brain stimulation perspective, our brain creates complexity. So when you do these repetitive uniplanar motions, our brain stops paying attention. So it just becomes very mindless. However, when you have these multi-planar ranges of motion, then the brain pays attention. It becomes more of a mindful experience. And when you're mindful, you're more mindful of the upright postural design of your posture to resist the force of gravity while performing these ranges of motion. So it's really important to think about that. Instead of just always doing the repetitive uniplanar motions, think about how you can make it more complex. Now, are we talking about in your exercise routine or daily life? What would be a good example of that? 
I'm very glad you asked that question because it's bold. And so for example, with your exercise routine, you know, instead of just doing a ton of bicep curls, think about how you can do more of a functional movement, such as a figure eight pattern, something like that, that goes across multiple ranges of motion. Also, when you're at your workplace, if you can utilize both hands instead of always utilizing your right hand to do a motion. Also, if you can, you know, sit and stand, then that's going to move and address different planes of motion while engaging with your occupation. So in the gym, as well as at work, it's important to think about more complexity with your movements. And you were just mentioning the, the trigger point ball under your foot. Instead of just moving that forward, you know, in a straight line, you can actually move it in a figure eight. Okay. So by doing stuff like that, that's a good stimulus to your posture system and a good stimulus to your brain because it creates that sensory feedback. Also that complexity that the brain craves. Excellent. Yeah, completely agree. And we'll see if we can link this up as well. But we have a previous training Thursday that talked about why you should move in multiple planes of motion. And a big part of that is like doing a transverse plane or doing chops or a motion like that. And what it does, though, it automatically when you start to move in some type of rotational based pattern or a lateral based movement, it is a large stimulus to your nervous system and your brain, which wakes everything up. So it just it moves you out of that pattern. And also what it does is it actually lengthens the muscles, which are supposed to be lengthened and work in a full range of motion. Because a lot of times when we're stuck in these same positions, we're not playing sports anymore. Maybe we've been playing sports for a decade or two decades or three decades. The body nice. just, it just starts to get locked up. The tendons get more calcified. They get tighter, the ligaments as well. And so just simply doing a lateral lunge, a transverse plunge, and this can be done with body weight only. I believe that once you start doing that, the, like you said, the entire body is connected. So when that happens, you're actually better able to implement the tips that we're talking about today about actually sitting up straight because your core has to engage whenever you do a rotational base pattern as well. So you don't actually fall over. So it's good. Exactly. Very good. <laughs> Perfect. That's a good um, transition into gym technique and proper lifting. So if you don't mind, I'll just touch on that for a second as our next tip. So one of the things I wanted to talk about at the gym is we were talking before about not leaning forward onto your desk. And I'm so glad you made that point. Even if you have that ergonomic equipment, you still need to have good postural design within your workspace. Same goes for the gym. What we commonly find is that C-shaped spinal curvature, again, with a forward head posture and here rolling the shoulders, is that we're, we're more flexor dominant, I refer to. So the flexor musculature, such as your pectoral musculatures, are dominant, meaning that they're contracted. But then your spinal stabilizers in the back of your spine, which are your extensor muscles, are weakened and they're lengthened. What we want to do is we want to restore that flexor extensor synergy. And one of the most common mistakes that I see is that when patients go to the gym or when people are going to the gym, and maybe you're listening right now from the gym, what we see is that they go to the gym and they're doing more flexion exercises. So for example, doing sit-ups and crunches or doing, you know, chest press or sitting on a stationary bike and leaning forward, you know, so the, the stationary bikes that are a little bit higher that force you to lean forward. This creates more flexion. Now, so many of our habits throughout our daily life, such as riding in a car, such as sitting at a computer screen, these create flexor dominance already. So when we get to the gym, we want to have that good technique that stimulates upright postural design instead of going into more and more flexion with gravity. We always want to resist gravity and stimulate extension. And, you know, when you think about when you're at the gym, maybe you really focus on your your technique while you're doing a heavy, heavy weight exercise, but then you take a break and you just kind of plop down or you take a break and you have your water bottle sitting on the ground. So you bend forward and just grab it. Every moment that we're at the gym, we need to be mindful of our posture because sometimes those are the moments that we'd go into these poor posture habits, even if we have good technique while doing our lifting, for example. So it's important to be mindful 100% of the time at the gym and think about stimulating more extension versus getting in the gym and doing more flexor exercises. Completely agree. I think that's a really good point. It's also why the machine circuit at your local gym is kind of one of the worst circuits that you could do because you're seated for the majority of the exercises, which is tightening sure. your hamstrings and hip flexors. And yeah. they're predominantly <laughs> like two to one for chest to back base exercises. So you're doing more pushing, which you don't need because you're always forward driving your car, leaning over your computer. All the chest muscles like you just talked about are tight. And there's not a lot of actually rowing or pulling back motions, which are going to help to strengthen those postural based muscles, whether it's the rhomboids or lat the lats or any of those muscles. So I think that's really important. Like you talked about in terms of functional based movement, meaning like when you're doing that exercise, 
could you see yourself doing that in real life? Not everything has to be correct for that, but for the most part, if you're at the gym, you should be standing. And that's because you're seated for the majority of the day. Why would you choose more exercises where you're already seated? So I don't know if you agree with that or yeah, not, but that's, that's what it, it A hundred percent. Excellent. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. So what's our next tip? Okay, the moving next our tip is going to be, yeah, the next tip is going to be the opposite of being at the gym, which is your sleep hygiene. Mm-hmm. So what's so interesting is if we think about our lives, when we reflect back on our lives, we're going to realize that we actually spent one third of our lifetime in bed, right? One third. So how important is our posture while sleeping? It's incredibly important. So even if you have good posture throughout the day, if you have poor posture at night while you're sleeping, that can actually affect how you perform the next day. So let's talk about sleep hygiene posture. So the tip then is to not sleep on your stomach. I recommend sleeping on your back or sleeping on your side. So when you're sleeping on your stomach, what happens is that you're turning your cervical spine, you're turning your neck to one side because most of us, when we're lying face down, we don't just have our nose down into the pillow, right? It's really hard to breathe in that yeah, scenario. Yeah. So we're going to turn our head completely to one side or the other. Now, when you wake up in the morning, maybe you've said things like, oh, I slept wrong last night or, oh, my neck is so stiff. Well, you could have avoided that completely by just having good posture of your, of your neck while sleeping. Also, it's going to create more pressure on your lower back because it's going to be constantly strained throughout the night. When you sleep on your back, then you're allowing your musculature to relax and you can have that even tone. And with your cervical spine, you can have it straight up. You can have your face looking up versus looking to one side or the other for eight hours while sleeping. Or while sleeping on your side, if you put a small pillow between your legs, then that's going to help keep your pelvis level while you're sleeping or keep your hips in the same alignment. So we were talking before about the alignment of your hips while seated on an exercise ball. Same thing goes with the bed. Are your hips aligned while you're sleeping? Because what tends to happen when we sleep on our side if we don't have a pillow between our legs is that we tend to roll forward on one side or the other. And with the pillow, it helps us keep good alignment of the hips so that when we wake up, we feel like we've had a neutral pelvis all night, which is going to help us perform better throughout the day. Yeah, I completely agree. I think side sleeping, like you just said, with just one pillow that can keep your spine in alignment, meaning like not with two pillows under your head on your side, where again, you're tightened up one side of the trapezius or the muscles on the yeah. side of the neck, and then one between your knees. I mean, that one little tip for a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people get rid of hip and lower back pain just based on putting another small pillow between the knees, and they're just so much more comfortable. I think that's a huge tip for people to take away, and, and so that's that's great. Any particular pillows and any ones that you really like? Yeah, you know, I love the memory foam myself. And But I do want to say one thing, and I mentioned this before with the ergonomic equipment, is I do recommend getting good ergonomic equipment because it's important, and I recommend getting a good mattress and getting good pillows. But the thing that I recommend the most is to focus on your body first, optimizing your posture, regardless of what mattress you're sleeping on or regardless of what chair you're sitting on in your office. It's great to have good ergonomic equipment and a good mattress, but always think about how you can save your body first. So instead of just thinking of getting a new mattress, think about how you can first focus on your sleeping habits and change to being coming a side sleeper if you've always been sleeping on your stomach. So when we do that, then that way if we go to a hotel over the weekend, then we're not suffering because we're in a new environment, for example. So retraining those posture habits is going to be very beneficial for you. I agree. And with those techniques like you just spoke about, you can get away with a mattress that isn't very good if you do put the pillow between your knees and another one. Or again, if they're very small pillows, they just squish and you need to, well, you do whatever you need to once you know your body in order to keep your spine in neutral, in alignment, which means like nose straight down your spine, right in the middle of the body with the sternum and not off the side. So completely agree because I, I do a lot of travel and same thing. Some hotel beds are great, some not so much. The pillows are usually terrible. But, you know, as long yeah. as I know the technique, I can get a, a good night's sleep for the most part. So that's excellent. Let's go over our, our posture breaks. I have that at number nine. Yeah, exactly. So number nine is to take posture breaks. So if you're seated right now, or maybe you're even standing, I want you to just do this with me. What I want you to do is if you're seated, go ahead and stand up for a moment. And you're going to move your arms out to the side. And then from this position, you're going to push your chest forward and pull your head back. 
and you're going to feel a nice stretch in your flexor muscles. So a nice stretch in your pectoral muscles, and you're going to go back into an extended position. Now you're going to hold this for 30 seconds and it's ideal to do it every single hour. Now, why would we spend this time doing posture breaks? The reason is this, is because while we're seated at our computer, while we're doing all of our flexor dominant habits that we do as human beings, we get pulled down with the force of gravity. We're never going to beat gravity. What we need to do is become more mindful of how we resist gravity. If we are not mindful of gravity, it will pull us down all day, all day long. However, by taking a posture break, we go anti-gravity. So we go into a nice upright postural positioning. We're able to reset our posture if we've been going into flexor dominance and just hold that nice stretch of the flexors for 30 seconds and then keep going with, that, with the rest of your work day. So you don't need to take too long, but just taking 30 seconds per hour is absolutely ideal to have good postural design and resist this flexor dominance that's so easy to, to have if we go mindless while, while we're working, mindless regarding our posture anyway. Excellent. Very, very good. Uh, and I like that too. And it just gives you, again, another reminder whether you set an alarm on your computer or your phone just to maybe every 30 minutes or whatever it might be, just to take some breaths at the same time. Cause that can also take you out of that, like go, go, go mode and just breathe, you know, take, take yes. a one minute meditation. <laughs> and that one minute meditation can be breathing through your nose, exhaling out some of that stress and opening up your chest. Excellent. Really like that. Yeah. So in addition to being a posture break, it's kind of a parasympathetic reset. Mm -hmm. So you go into that parasympathetic mode for a minute. And when you do that, after the posture break, you just feel so much better and you're ready to keep going with your work day instead of becoming more and more stressed, more and more hunched over and just going with gravity the rest of the day. You can actually offset that with posture breaks. Excellent. So we have the posture break, opening the chest, breathing in through the nose, out through your mouth, close your eyes for a second, and then maybe take some water. That's a nice little one minute break right there. Yeah, it is. A good so, minute spent. That's a minute invested. That is one minute invested, exactly. You'll get more out of that, out of productivity, no doubt about it. We could talk a whole show on yeah. that. So I want to yeah. learn more about the posture exams that you do in your own practice and that you recommend, and then how often you recommend to have these done. Yeah, so the final tip is a yearly posture evaluation. Now, it's the recommendation of the American Posture Institute that every man, woman, and child starting at six years old should have a yearly posture evaluation. Now, the reason we recommend this is that you have a posture examination done with posture imaging. Now, what's so valuable about posture imaging is you can actually get images done of your posture. Now, this is important because the person that does the image for you, the posture expert, the doctor that does that image for you, then they can look and evaluate if there's early onset indication of postural distortion patterns. And if there is, then we can track that over time. We can instantly give you good exercises, good recommendations for posture habit re-education to offset that before it becomes a serious problem. And maybe, you know, one year you have great posture. Posture, but then we can see over time that you're starting to get more hunched over, or have more forward head posture. We can stay ahead of that and we can evaluate that over time from your baseline posture image each year after that. So just like you have a lot of yearly examinations done from a preventative perspective, the same thing goes with your posture. It's almost crazy to think about ignoring the structural design of your body, isn't it? So we want to be proactive and we want to evaluate that each year. And if there is any indication of postural distortion patterns, then we want to be proactive and correcting it right away. Without a doubt. And for anyone who doesn't know exactly what these postural images look like, it's at least the way that we do it, it's basically like a graph in the background. And yeah. you get to see from a front angle, a back angle, and a side angle of some of these things that we're talking about, the kyphotic shoulder posture, maybe an S-curve in the back, any of these things. And I think it's really important because people say, like, well, why does it really matter? If you have shoulder and neck tension, if you get headaches or migraines, like these can be structural based issues or even brain fog and fatigue. You know, there's a little area that we like to talk about in, in the, the medical world, uh, especially natural medical world, is the trigeminal region of the, of the head right behind the ears. And if you think about it, your head is like this eight pound or so object. Some heads are bigger than others. And when it's stretched out in front of you too far, that acts like a weight that your neck and your shoulders are constantly trying to pull back. That can disturb blood flow. It can cause all sorts of different tension. And these images can be really revealing. We've done them with um, golf professionals we've worked with, with a lot of people with um, you know shoulder, neck pain. And uh, I think it's 
it's excellent. I, I really do recommend them. And, um, you know, for those who are, are able to, are able to find someone in their network, in their area, really great adjunct to your overall health fitness based protocol. And it's something that is going to, it's kind of like a lab test. It's going to say yes or no, am I in good health? And it, and it just shows you that. So the one recommendation I would say is when you're having those photos done, be natural. Don't try to perfect your posture yeah. for that. Just stand how you normally stand. Don't try to act pretty for the camera and uh, and you'll get your best reading because then you'll get real recommendations. A lot of times we see one shoulder elevated, one shoulder a little lower from someone carrying a bag always on one side and, you know, really nice things to see because then you can make those changes from a real world perspective. And when someone's in less pain, things change. I mean, they are in a better mood, they have better energy. So really, really great. I appreciate all of your time today. I know you're a busy person, a busy practice, (laughs) and you're helping a lot of health professionals as well out there. I know you have some upcoming certifications. You don't do them all year round, but when they're available, I know they're fantastic. A lot of people are benefiting from you. A lot of our listeners are health professionals. If they want to reach out to you now, of course, we'll link up everything today. Just go to stephencabral.com forward slash 489. But how can everyone see you and meet with you and chat with you on social media, your websites, and let us know? Yeah, guys, let's stay connected. So if you want to join us on Facebook, you can follow us at American Posture Institute. And if you want to join our Facebook group, what I love to do in the Facebook groups is get on there and do a lot of live trainings, make these things very applicable. So the Facebook group that I encourage you to join is called Postural Ergonomics. So again, Postural Ergonomics Facebook group and connect with me there. I go live almost every day so you can actually ask me questions directly and I'd love to connect with you. Sounds absolutely fantastic. Thank you once again for your time. And we will absolutely link up everything that we talked about today, as well as all of our favorites. So I'm going to go back with Dr. Krista. I'm going to ask her, okay, what's your favorite anti-fatigue mat, gravity-based mat, uh, standing desk? I mean, there's a lot we could have talked about today. Meaning like you don't even have to buy a standing desk. They make these little things that go on top of your current desk and just raise up your laptop so it's much less expensive. And then you can eventually go as far down the rabbit hole as you'd like, where I've certainly gone. And you can get, you know, all these different (laughs) things and gadgets to play with. It makes life, I think, more interesting. You get start to get deeper into the healthier lifestyle. So once again, appreciate your time today and look forward to all of our listeners being able to connect with you in the future. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Did you know that the body really only becomes sick or unbalanced in only two ways? Over time, you become deficient in vital nutrients and you also accumulate toxins internally and from the environment. As those nutrients diminish and you increase your total toxic load, your body then begins to show the first signs of dis-ease. It's actually quite predictable and the good news is that if we know how you began to fill up that proverbial rain barrel, We also know how to empty it to begin the healing process. I was fortunate enough to learn this ancient healing process from my mentor after suffering from debilitating diseases for close to a decade. It was only when I began to implement these techniques did I finally overcome my illnesses and go on to live a life of energy and vitality that I now enjoy. I'd like to share with you now what I discovered after traveling all over the world and how to combine the best of ancient healing wisdom with state-of-the-art science. Allow me to teach you exactly how I've been able to help over a quarter of a million people to empty their rain barrel and begin to transform their body and lives into what they've always hoped they could be. To get your copy of the international bestseller, The Rain Barrel Effect, simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash rain barrel.